Hi there, Dr. Terry Shaneyfelt for UAB Department of Medicine. In part one of this two-part series, I'm going to critically appraise a study by Forbes and colleagues published in British Medical Journal in May of 2014 entitled Quantification of Risk Factors for Herpes Zoster, a population-based case control study. In part two, we'll go through what the results of this study showed. So we're going to focus on critical appraisal in this uh, uh, video. And one of the things I'm going to do, and I always do when I read a paper, is I look to see what the objective of the study was. And that's usually in, in often in the last paragraph of the introductory section. So one of the things you can see, one of the things they wanted to do was to quantify the effects of various proposed risk factors on the development of herpes zoster. And they wanted to explore the effect of these risk factors if they differed by age. Those are the two main objectives. And that seems like an important objective, so I think it's worth further reading this paper. So now we need to delve into the methods section and see just what they did and make sure that they designed this study free of bias. So first thing I want to know is just how were the cases and controls selected and was this done the same way? So were the cases and controls identified the same way? And what they used here was they used this um, this UK clinical practice research database and as you can see it's a primary care database that has lots of patient information in it including prescribing information, diagnostic information, a variety of things. So it's a very rich database for which they're going to mine. Now being a database there's always limitations in that these usually aren't developed for research purposes, they're developed for clinical purposes. Sometimes we have questions we just can't answer with these databases. And then what they did is to select um, cases and controls. They used this database and they used the coding in the database. You can see they use ICD-10 codes and they used a variety of them that indicated herpes zoster. So to be a case, cases were patients with herpes zoster or shingles and controls were people who did not have uh, herpes zoster or shingles. And importantly, they wanted this to be the primary diagnosis. So they excluded people who, for which herpes was just, or shingles, I'm sorry, was just recorded as a secondary diagnosis. They really wanted to try to find patients for which the visit was really primarily for um, shingles, the development of shingles. And their controls, again, were selected using the same database. And here, these were people who were going to be um, free of, of, of shingles. They weren't going to have it because they are the control. So controls had no history of um, shingles or post-herpetic neuralgia at the index date. And the index date is the time when a case um, was diagnosed with um, zoster. They also did something interesting here. They did matching. So they matched each control and case patient on the practice that they're in. So the, the group of doctors um, that controlled them um, for um, sex and also age. So this is a good way to try to control for some important confounders up front in the design phase of a study. So each time a case was selected, a control was found in the same practice who had the same gender and who had the same age within one year. So that's what that means. And we want to make sure, and this is a tough part when we look at who the cases and controls are, is that both cases and controls should have been able to be exposed to whatever it is we're interested in. It's not that they did, but they should have the same chance of exposure. So an absurd example is if we're looking at um, uterine cancer and hormone replacement therapy. And if we, our cases would be a group of women with uterine cancer, and we go back in time to look to see if they were exposed to hormones. Well, our controls could be a group of men because men will not have uterine cancer, but there's a problem there because they never could have been or should have been exposed to hormones. So this would be a, an example of a bad um, or, or selection bias, a bad case of picking a control which could have never been exposed to what we were looking at. So this requires some clinical knowledge and just looking who the cases and controls are, looking at their demographics, and making sure there's not something that would have precluded them from having what the uh, authors were trying to study. And so which gets us to the next thing is what were they trying to study? What risk factors or in a general sense exposures were they looking for? So the key risk factors were some inflammatory diseases like rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, inflammatory bowel disease, COPD, asthma, chronic kidney disease, depression, um, and diabetes. So those were the main risk factors. They also look for some things that they call severe immunosuppressive suppression. So these are people who had things like HIV, who had um, um, bone marrow or stem cell transplant, who had a variety of 
blood malignancies like um, myeloma, leukemias, lymphomas. Um, so th these are the main things that you would list as exposures. Um, also people who are on immunosuppressive treatments. Um, um, and all this was done and, um, and looked at um, using this database again. So again, these weren't, they weren't interviewing patients, examining them. These were using the database to try to identify these factors. And then they looked at a variety of other things that they, um, excuse me, that they mentioned down here in, in other characteristics like smoking and body mass index, things like that. These would be considered the exposures. So they're going to have their cases and controls, people with shingles, people without. They're going to go back in time to look to see how many of them had these types of things, had rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, things like that. So these would be what's considered um, the exposures of interest. Finally, we need to see was follow-up um, significantly long enough and complete. Now in a case control study there isn't really follow-up because cases uh, are identified who already have disease so follow-up has happened but you want to go back and look to see um, was the time period that they go backwards to look to see um, if a patient um, was exposed to these risk factors. You need to um, to make sure that that's long enough. So we have to go back up here and one of the interesting things they did is they looked at, um, at identifying these things in the previous 12 months. Um, so that, to me, I wonder, is that really sort of long enough? Well, I'm not going to get this to be able to highlight. Is 12 months really long enough? And I guess it says really at least 12 months of follow-up. So it could be longer. Um, I'd like to see a lot longer follow-up. This is a database. They should have um, pretty long-term follow-up of these patients. But at least they didn't look at something like one month, which would definitely not be a long enough period of time. Again, this requires just your clinical judgment of deciding was this follow-up long enough. So in general, I think these authors did a pretty good job. Um, the cases in control were selected in the same way. They probably had the same chance of having one of those um, diseases like rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, leukemias, etc. Um, they um, measured them all in the same way using the database. And follow-up was probably long enough if you had one of these things to go on and develop leukemia. So I'm happy with this study. I think it's at low risk of bias. And I'm now happy to go on and try to look at the results.